Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. Chocolate! 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 Yeah, you heard that right. We're talking about chocolate today. I don't think I'm saying anything controversial or highly disputed when I say that the 1992 New England Patriots were a really, really bad football team. If the 1990 season hadn't happened, then calling the 1992 season the worst season in Patriots history would not be an over-exaggeration in the slightest bit. Everything that could have gone wrong for this team did, as they finished the season 2-14 while posting the worst record in football, the second worst offense in football by scoring just 205 points, or barely 12 points per game, and the second worst point differential in football at minus 158, being one of just two teams that season to even have a point differential in a negative triple figures alongside the Seattle Seahawks. Heck, I already did a video on just how bad this team was, and how bad head coach Dick McPherson was, seeing as he made a critical decision during a game against the Buffalo Bills, because he had no idea what the score of the game was, even though you could obviously alleviate the problem by having any awareness at all, and by, oh I don't know, just looking up at the freaking scoreboard. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. At least brighter days were ahead for the Pats with a number one pick in the draft and with Bill Parcells coming out of retirement to coach the team. But the 1992 season was a dark time to be a Pats fan, especially with their 0-9 start to the year and their not one, not two, but three shutouts and their stretch at one point in the year when they win 10 consecutive quarters or more than two and a half hours of game time without scoring a single point. And if you want any incident that sums up just how bad and how laughable the Patriots were, and just how awful the 1992 season was in just about every sense of the word, from both an on-the-field and off-the-field perspective, this story might do the trick. Because in the penultimate home game of the season, which came against the team's division rival, the Indianapolis Colts in the AFC East, the Pats did something absolutely crazy to screw their fans even more than they had already been screwed, and they had been screwed over a lot. They had to watch a garbage team in garbage weather in a garbage stadium and had to deal with garbage relocation rumors about the team leaving Foxborough and potentially bolting to St. Louis. And this controversial thing was how they were treated. It's a bizarre story, that's definitely been forgotten more than three decades later, especially since very few people even showed up at this game in the first place. But it's one that deserves a deep dive today. Because this is the story behind Chocolate Gate, and one of the dumbest controversies in the over 60 year history of the New England Patriots franchise. Before I talk about the controversy in question, and the reaction to it and why nothing about this controversy made any sense at all, we need some context to understand what exactly the fans in the stadium were watching, so we can understand their perspective and their frustration as it was. Because oh man, it was not good. It's December 6, 1992. It's week 14 of the NFL season, and as the year is starting to come to a close, and mercifully I might add for Pats fans, we have a game on our hands over at Foxborough Stadium between the Indianapolis Colts and the New England Patriots. Of all the games on the schedule this week, this was probably the worst one on paper. Actually, scratch that, this was the worst one on paper. Indy entered this game at 5 and 7, just about out of the playoff picture barring a complete miracle, while the Patriots were 2 and 10 and were the worst team in football. You've got two teams with a combined record of 7 and 17, or a winning percentage of 29%. It 
It's an absolutely garbage matchup that unless you're in Indianapolis or any secondary markets, you're not going to be able to watch legally on television because the number of NBC affiliates picking up this game has to be in the single digits. But hey, sometimes the garbage matchups between two teams with horrible records produce free games. Sometimes the games that mean nothing, these are the kinds of games that can be a ton of fun and can be the best games of the year. Heck, the best game of the 2019 season might have been the overtime thriller and crazy comeback in the battle between the 3-11 Miami Dolphins and the 1-13 Cincinnati Bengals. That game was amazing, so you never know. Maybe this game will be a pleasant surprise. Yeah, that was not the case. In fact, in terms of games that were never, at any point, decided by 7 points or more, meaning that a touchdown or extra point by the losing team would have given them the lead, so it was always in reach, this might be the worst game of all time. I am not kidding, I am not over-exaggerating, this game was one of the most brutal games of football of all time, and definitely in the post-merger era. If you were at the stadium on this day and suffer through this game, my condolences, and you and you alone, I'm happy for you that you got to witness a two-decade-long dynasty, because you earned it. If YouTube age restricts this video for being inappropriate for kids, I wouldn't blame them, because no one, and especially no child, should be subjected to this crappy football. When all was said and done, the Colts won by a final score of 6 to nothing. Two field goals. That was it. To prove how awful of a game it was, here's a highlight reel of every play that went for 20 or more yards. Roll the tape. Seriously, not a single play of 20 plus yards. That seems almost impossible in today's NFL, especially since the two teams combined to attempt 66 passes. But somehow, these two clubs found a way. That's how bad it was. And for the Patriots fans that had to endure this game by their team, oh man, if ever the phrase ugly with a capital U applies, it's for this game and this performance right here. Because this game really was ugly with a capital U. Despite the fact that the Pats did not turn the ball over once, they had about the worst offensive performance imaginable with a positive turnover margin. On the day, the Pats had 94 yards of offense. They ran 62 plays and picked up 94 yards. That comes out to approximately 1.5 yards per play, which is so bad that if you gave the Pats six tries to get a first down instead of the usual four, they would still be short by a yard. The team took eight sacks for a not-so-nice 69 yards, and finished the day with 23 net passing yards. And the team had 56 yards of penalties, all of which came on offense for the most part through false starts and holdings and illegal men downfield. So if you combine the net yards and the penalty yards, the team actually had 38 yards all day while holding onto the ball for just 23 minutes. That's just atrocious. And I should note that uh, this man right here, quarterback Scott Zolak, replaced two mil in midway through the contest coming in during the second half. And he did nothing of note. He had 15 net passing yards. He got sacked five times. He went six for 20. And he finished the game with a passer rating of 39.6, which is, well... It's actually exactly what your pass rating would be if you did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. So, uh, yeah. Good job, Scout. So, yeah. This game was really bad. And making matters even worse for the fans who watched their team lose at home in this ugly affair was the fact that it was absolutely freezing. Only 19,429 fans attended this game which meant you had an NBA-sized crowd in an NFL-sized stadium. In terms of attendance, this is believed to be, excluding the COVID season and excluding any numbers after the Houston Oilers announced their move and were a lame duck team in their own city, the smallest crowd for an NFL game since the 1987 strike and the replacement player games. It's tough to blame the Pats fans for not showing up. 
aside from the fact that the team was terrible, it was brutally cold and windy. It was not pleasant conditions by any means. Today, under the current formula, the wind chill factor from this game would be 11 degrees. But under the old formula that was used in 1992, when you combine the 26 degree temperatures at kickoff with brutal 23 mile per hour winds, you get a wind chill factor of minus 5 degrees. Not only are you dealing with a wind chill in the negatives that is unsafe and uncomfortable to be in, let alone for 3 or 4 hours, but you're doing it while sitting on metal bleachers, since Foxborough Stadium is an absolute dump. You can learn more about just how awful that stadium was by clicking the card in the upper right corner. So if you're going to go to the game and brave the cold weather to watch this team play, you've got to be prepared, and you've got to find ways to keep yourself warm. That means bundling up with layers, bringing blankets and whatnot, and maybe warming yourself up by drinking some hot chocolate. The Patriots back then sold hot chocolate at all of their games. It wasn't just the cold weather games, it was all of their games. Even in the preseason, for games taking place in early August, when you don't need anything to keep yourself warm, if anything you might need the opposite, they sold hot chocolate. Today at Gillette Stadium, they only serve hot chocolate during cold weather games, which makes sense. But hot chocolate at Foxborough Stadium, no matter how hot or how cold it was, was a staple. And for every single game during that 1992 season, and for a while I might add, the price of the hot cocoa was one dollar. For a buck, you gotta keep yourself warm and gotta sip some hot chocolate. Adjusted for inflation, that's two dollars and eighteen cents. And honestly, that's a pretty good deal, especially since that game is today, hot chocolate will run you $5. So a good chunk of the roughly 19,000 fans who were trying to stay warm and knew the drill with the hot chocolate prices tried to buy hot chocolate at this scheme, because quite frankly, they needed it. And when they arrived at the concession stands throughout the stadium, they were even more enraged than they were before because the Patriots did something insane for this game. You know what would be a good idea? Let's price gouge the crap out of the hot chocolate and make it way more expensive than it usually is. Because now, instead of hot chocolate costing $1, it costs $1.50. That is a 50% increase and comes out today, adjusted for inflation, to three dollars and twenty-seven cents, or more than a dollar what it was before. You know how some companies, during times of crisis, price gouge things because they know they're in high demand. A hurricane's coming, so you're likely going to need a generator and some cases of water. Let's raise those prices because you don't really have a choice. A snowstorm is coming, so you're likely going to need a shovel. Let's raise those prices because you don't really have a choice. Because if you don't have one and you don't buy one, you're going to be snowed in. Well, the Pats did that here with the hot chocolate. Raising the price by a whopping 50% for this game in negative wind chill. Two cups of hot chocolate would cost you the same as three cups usually cost. The fans already hate you and are dwindling because a relocation looks eminent and the team stinks. Let's make them hate you even more by raising the price of the hot chocolate during one of the coldest games in franchise history at the time. Genius idea. But hang on, because it gets worse. Because according to Foxborough Stadium Associates, this wasn't price gouging in their eyes. This was, get ready for this, a marketing mistake. Seriously. They didn't mean to raise the prices in the stadium on the hot chocolate. It just happened to work out that way. Said Brian O'Donovan, the general manager of the stadium in an absolutely laughable statement, it was accidental. There was no intention whatsoever 
of doing something like this in reaction to the cold weather. Which is just funny. Because when I think of something accidental, I think of something like making a spelling error, or misspeaking, or trying to pass the ball to my teammate and it slips out of my hand and doesn't go where I want it to go. I think of a heat of the moment thing. I don't think of adjusting the concession boards and the prices and whatnot. That seems like a pretty conscious choice. However, O'Donovan continued, as he explained that the concession stands raised the price because they thought a new price change had gone into effect. They thought a new price change had gone into effect? I'm sorry, what? Why would they think that? They didn't just think of that on their own. They didn't just go wrong. No one running the concession stand went to bed on Saturday night with a price at a dollar, and then woke up Sunday morning and thought to themselves, you know what? I think President Bush signed a new bill mandating a price increase on the hot chocolate, so I better play it on the safe side and change that for this scheme, because I'm not sure if that takes effect immediately or in 1993. How does a misunderstanding like this happen? This explanation by O'Donovan means either one of two things. And honestly, I'm not sure what's worse. Either they intentionally price gouged the ever-loving crap out of the hot chocolate for this scheme that you've been watching, got such a bad reaction from it, and backtracked by saying that it was a mistake, and that everyone just magically raised their prices by complete accident because of a miscommunication in an excuse that no one is buying, or you're that incompetent of a general manager of your own freaking stadium that you didn't communicate with your concession staff at all, or in your walkthrough around the stadium before the game, assuming that you even did one, you never noticed that the concession pricing boards looked very, very different. Either way, this was a massive screw-up. You're telling me you raised the prices on coincidentally a brutally cold day by complete accident because they thought a price change went into effect even though they would have obviously gotten the idea for that from you? The Chewbacca defense from South Park makes more sense than this defense. That's how bad it is. Now, there are no stats whatsoever on how much money they actually made with the hot chocolate sales on that day and how many fans bought the hot chocolate. But after the game between the two teams behind me, the Patriots' final home game of the season came in Week 17 against the Miami Dolphins. The temperature was actually colder for that game. It was 9 degrees wind chill under the modern formula, compared to 11 degrees for the Patriots' cold game under the modern formula, and the hot chocolate price for that game was back to a dollar. So take all of that information for what it's worth. Side note, if you were one of the 19,000 people who braved the cold and were actually at Foxborough Stadium for that horrible, horrible game between the Patriots and the Colts, where they price gouged you out of the hot chocolate, let me know in the comments down below. This 1992 season was truly a disaster for the Pats in just about every way imaginable, and in every capacity that you can think of. The on-field product was awful, and the off-field product was even worse. And perhaps no controversy, even if it might be pretty small in the grand scheme of things, better sums up how bad that season was than Hot Chocolate Gate, if that's what you want to call it. Because the Pats fans, on this day, spoke loud and clear. If you're going to decrease our win total by 67%, you better not raise the price of our hot chocolate out of nowhere by 50%. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.